Hello friends, I am Dori Clark and I am here on behalf of Newsweek with the incredible Farnoosh Tarabi. She is the author of You're So Money and When She Earns More and the podcast host of the fantastic 1100 plus episode five years in running podcast, So Money. Farnoosh, amazing to have you here. Thank you so much, Dori and Newsweek for having me. This is such an honor. Thanks. And we have an exciting conversation coming up today talking about thriving financially during COVID. But before we get into it, uh, I will just mention for those of you who are tuning in live, we'd love to hear who you are and where you're from. So please feel free to type into the chat box. We'll give some shout outs. We'd love to see uh, where you're tuning in from. And of course, as the uh, time progresses, we are going to be taking your questions for Farnoosh. So Farnoosh, the first question that I have for you, obviously these are some crazy disrupted times financially. So many people, 50 plus million Americans lost their jobs during this time. You have been on the front lines as a financial journalist and as someone running a, you know, a, a podcast about financial acuity. I am mm -hmm. curious, what would you say is the predominant sentiment right now? Um, we, uh, we've been through so much. What what have you seen evolve and where do you feel like uh, the pulse of the people is right now when it comes to thinking about money and planning? Well, I think what we've learned as a result of the pandemic, the subsequent recession, but also this summer, the Black Lives Matter movement and this resurgence and uh, need for revisiting you know, racial justice and how that all impacts our bottom line and financial wellness. That Those are the things that I've been kind of reflecting on. And I think what the takeaways for me that are new, um, one, there was, there has been forever this adage that, you know, financial independence is an independent journey that we would praise people, you know, who would share their narratives of pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, rags to riches stories of using my own sort of perseverance and determination and planning to become financially successful. And those stories are fan fantastic. They're super inspiring. But I think that um, we are realizing now more than ever that the ability for people, especially certain people of color, right? People who uh, may not have uh, been born with resources, with, uh, you know, these things that we all take for granted, you know, access to things like, um, you know, uh, a stable home environment or access to, you know, just things like technology or even just, you know, basics. Those people, of course, can go on to be successful, but more than ever now we realize that it's through, it, we, we need the collective to help people become financially successful, that it should not be the, just on one person's responsibility, that you know we need people like institutions, the government, society, friends, neighbors, everybody to, to take a stake in everybody's financial well-being. Because when one person is financially successful, that person touches on so many other people's lives. It is to everyone's benefit to help everybody be financially successful. And I think we're seeing some of that um, come to the surface now where, you know, we're changing the way that we celebrate financial success. You know, we want to, we want to recognize the, the privileges that we've had. We want to recognize the mentors that we've had. We want to recognize the free services that we took advantage of. And, um, I want to tell everybody who is struggling that it is a mistake. Your biggest mistake is to feel as though you have to go it alone, that there is some sort of shame in letting others know that you're struggling, that you need help making your mortgage payment, or that you know, you've know you lost your job and you're have, you didn't have the savings account that everyone tells you you're supposed to have, um, that you need to voice this and that there is help out there, but the only way to really get to the help is to first be your biggest advocate accept that you need help and tell others that you do, whether that's your landlord, a family member, your lender, your college, um, so that you can work something out because otherwise you're, the chances of getting that help are slim. 
Yeah, Farnoosh, thank you so much for that. And I just want to give a shout out to the folks who are tuning in live here. We have Sue from Chicago, Jennifer's in Toronto, Trisha from Pennsylvania, Toxin from California, Rosinda from Mexico. So glad you guys wow. are here. We've got Nigeria in the house. Oh, this is fantastic. Uh, so Irina, welcome. Uh, so happy to see all of you guys here. And uh, we're delighted to dive into this conversation with Farnoosh Tarabi, the host of the So Money podcast. If you're enjoying the conversation, please hit like, please hit share so other people can benefit from the conversation as well. Now, Farnoosh, I know that you have been spending a lot of time during the last six, seven, however many months of COVID writing and sharing your perspectives. And some of your views are a little bit uh, sort of counterintuitive, uh, mm -hmm. certainly contrary to what the typical framework is that people recommend in personal finance. And I'd love to hear some of the top things that you feel like maybe we actually ought to be questioning a little bit yeah. more. Yes. So I actually was on the Today Show last week. Uh, I wrote an article uh, for Next Advisor, which is Time Magazine's new financial platform, about the new rules that I think we need to pay attention to in this environment and maybe even forever going forward. That, you know, there were these old traditional rules that we stood by that did serve us in good times, but now we're questioning them. So, for example, we would always say that it's important to pay down your debt, uh, make that the priority, if, even if it means not, you know, shoring up cash for a rainy day. That you know, that the interest that you're paying on your credit cards—that's the nastiest thing to have. Focus on that, and then try to save. I would say the reverse right now. If you don't have a rainy day account. If you don't have at least a month or two's worth of living expenses shored up somewhere, that's a real risk for a lot of people. That's a huge threat. And I would say make your debt pay down you know, the second thing on your to-do list. And, and, and now there is more flexibility with that. You can call your credit card company and they can put you on a payment plan. They might allow you to, to defer your payments. So, you know, going back to what I was originally saying, you know, asking for help, there's more help uh, on the debt pay down side than there is on the savings side. The savings side is really up to us at this point to find those ways to save, to uh, prioritize that. So maybe now saving is more important than paying down debt. Secondly, there's this adage of stay the course. If you're looking at the stock market, if you're looking at the election and really nervous about what that's going to mean for your portfolio, um, maybe take a look at your portfolio. You know, there's no harm in re-educating yourself on what is actually under the hood. I think sometimes we get on autopilot to our disadvantage in our financial life. I love automation. It's a great way to stay on the course. Uh, but if your emotions are running high, I don't want to be that financial expert that's like, ignore your mental health, ignore your emotions. I think that's a real risky thing to say. Rather, maybe it's, okay, recognize how you're feeling. Let's explore this. Let's go and see how you're actually invested in your retirement account. And understand that, you know, you don't want to make any emotion driven knee jerk reactions and moves. But if that's going to if you're losing sleep at night, and I wrote about this for Bloomberg, if you're losing sleep at night, that is actually a, a sign <laughs> that you might want to stop and and think about, okay, am I actually on the right path? Am I in am I is my portfolio risk appropriate for where I am. You know, a lot of us started our retirement portfolios, if we were lucky, in our 20s when we got that first job. We opened up that 401k, we set some sort of allocation based on our age, risk tolerance, goals. Well, now you might be 40, you might be 50. Have you revisited your portfolio? And if the environment right now, the circumstances of the day are triggering you emotionally, well, let's act on that trigger only so far as to say, let's look at the portfolio again. Maybe your life has changed. Maybe your risk tolerance has changed. You've learned a little bit about yourself over the last nine months, eight months. And then using that can that inform maybe some redirection in your portfolio? For me, the answer was yes. You know, I'm when I started my portfolio, I wasn't married, Dory. I didn't have kids. I wasn't a business owner. I wasn't the breadwinner. I wasn't living in a pandemic or in a recession. A lot now, of things have, changed, eh? There's a lot of the sort of circumstances that have changed. And that to, for me meant that 
my appetite for risk just isn't where it was 20 years ago. And I think that's true for a lot of people. When time goes on and you get closer to retirement, you need to adjust. So for that reason, I did reduce my stock expo exposure in my portfolio. I'm still very much invested in the stock market, but um, I, my, my sort of the play was, you know, Farnoosh is losing sleep. Let's recognize this. Let's revisit the portfolio. Let's use common sense and say, okay, what are my what are my goals? How am I feeling sort of as far as risk goes? Is my portfolio adjusted appropriately? And I also know that because I'm taking sort of a more conservative approach to investing, there are other aspects of my financial life that I need to now also counterbalance for that, right? So if I'm not maybe going to take on this aggressive approach in my portfolio, I may not hit the same retirement goals that I thought I would by the time I'm 65. So what does that mean as far as how much I should be contributing? If I still want to hit that goal, it means I have to contribute more. So that's the trade-off. Yeah, Farnoosh, thank you very much. That's great. And I'd love to invite all of you guys who are tuning in live, please feel free to start typing your questions for Farnoosh into the chat box because I have a couple more for her, but we are very soon going to start taking yours. So we'd love to hear what is on your mind uh, so we can take advantage of having her here live with us. And I'll also just remind you, if you are not currently following Newsweek on LinkedIn, please open up a new window on your browser. Go ahead and follow uh, LinkedIn, follow Newsweek on LinkedIn. You can also follow me as well. I'm Dory Clark. You can you can actually go to this link, doryclark.com slash LI. And that is my LinkedIn profile. You can follow me. And of course, you should follow Farnoosh Tarabi on LinkedIn as well. So please type your, your questions for Farnoosh into the chat box. Bagels. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I'm telling my son that we don't have bagels. Sorry about that. I thought I was on mute. You know, this is this is the essence <sighs> of the live stream. This is, Welcome uh, to my this world. Stuff. Absolutely, Thri we're th we're thriving in so many ways during COVID. <laughs> so, for new speaking of that, obviously, for, you know, for very very obvious reasons, um, so much of the attention has gone to the financial devastation that many people in many industries, you know, travel, hospitality, et cetera, et cetera, have faced during COVID. But also it, it seems that there's really been a disparate impact that some people in some industries have actually done really surprisingly well during COVID. Yeah. If you were offering advice to a regular professional at this point about what they can do, uh, either if they have lost a job or if they just want to protect themselves a little bit better from future financial uncertainty, what should, what should a regular person be doing now or thinking about now in order to position themselves for the next shock, whatever that might yeah. be coming down the pike? That's such an excellent question. I really uh, want to give some good advice here because it's true that uh, this time next year, five years from now, we're going to look back and the economy will have changed. The work, the work environment will have changed. Um, I think that what we're learning in this environment is that a lot of the changes that were already afoot are only being accelerated. So companies that, for example, their five-year plan was to migrate more towards the internet or become more virtual. Well, that's their reality today. Companies that were, you know, maybe uh, contemplating, uh, you know, a work from home sort of situation, that's their reality today. Or, you know, they were in one industry, but they realized, that like there's a lot of small business owners that you know for example were in retail or clothing well no one's really buying a lot of clothes right now but they can use the fabrics and their skills to make masks and other sorts of things and so these pivots are happening a lot faster than maybe what businesses would have anticipated but here we are so i think the assignment for anyone who wants to create job security is to think about how can i continue to develop the skills that will be important next year and five years from now. If I want to stay in this in this industry, let's just hold on there for a second. If you want to stay in your industry, well, where's your industry going? You know, you're already seeing a lot of shifts, talking to your managers, talking to industry leaders, reading the news, seeing where the, the changes are happening. What are the, the skills that are going to be required that maybe weren't required last year, but will be in the going forward for you to be able to advance 
in this industry that you love. Now, um, others might be working in, like, let's say, travel, right, which has been so hard hit uh, in this in this pandemic. People are going to go back to traveling again, but maybe you've sort of lost your appetite for working in the travel industry. You want to pivot. Well, it's about figuring out making sort of an inventory list of all of the skills and experiences that you've had in this, you know, in this industry and how they can be reapplied to something new. And then what are those gaps that you need to fill either through education or internships or experience? This is a great time to be investing in yourself. So that's the first tip is kind of identifying where are the skill gaps that I can fill, uh, whether that's taking a free online course through Stanford or on LinkedIn or anywhere else to, sort of, uh, you know, uh, position yourself in a way where you're going to be really attractive for the next job. The other thing is, of course, adding another revenue stream, thinking more entrepreneurially, even or intrapreneurially. If you're at a company, how can you be that person that takes your company to the next level because you identify a problem that you want to lead solving in addition to maybe doing your own job but sort of straddling you know your role and then something exciting and new a project that you want to take on at your company you know for me i feel like you know i got laid off in 2009 in the recession i'm a perfect example of somebody who was completely surprised uh that i would be you know like what i'm i'm not a valuable employee no no there are no sacred cows in a in a recession let alone a pandemic recession i was um, laid off too so i i yeah, feel, yeah. and so i had i was at this crossroad of do i you know try to find another job in news where everyone's losing their jobs and yes of course things bounced back. But in that time frame, there was really not, there were not a lot of options for me to go back and find a similar job. So I chose a, a probably a, a harder path, but in the long run, a much more, a better path for me, one that did have more job security, which was to create my own revenue streams, was to basically start a business and leverage the skills that I had developed working in uh, at a desk job for 10 years um, to now working for myself. Uh, so becoming a speaker, becoming an author, becoming a content developer, you know, all of these things, a podcaster, these are all the skills that I learned on the job, but now I'm able to do independently for others through contracts and, you know, answering to myself only. And that was something that I started in the recession. A recession is a great time to start a business, by the way. Um, the, you know, the overhead is, is a lot more affordable in a recession, typically, whether you're talking about hiring talent, uh, office space, obviously, no, you don't need that. You can't have that right now. Um, and so I would encourage people to think entrepreneurially and, you know, even if it's starting small, what's one side revenue you can bring in? We can all teach something. You, we are all teachers. Whatever experience you have had in your job, there is something that you're known for, that people come to you over and over again for your advice. What is that? How can you monetize that? And then use the internet to teach it. It's a great way to experiment with the beginnings of maybe building an online learning teaching platform and, and going down that path of being a, a consultant, a teacher and building revenue, perhaps in addition to a corporate job, a nine to five. I certainly couldn't agree with you more, Farnoosh. Of course, you know. I know my most recent book, in fact, is Entrepreneurial You, which is about this exact topic, how to create multiple revenue streams for yourself, uh, whether whether or not you uh, you have a day job. It's a valuable thing to be cultivating, especially now. So thank you for sharing that. And we have some great questions coming in. Please feel free, guys, if you're tuning in live, uh, please, uh, first of all, hit the like and share button to spread the word about this conversation. But also, uh, we'd love to take your questions for finance expert Farnoosh Tarabi about how to thrive during COVID financially. So a great question came in from Kathy. She wants to know, 
know, how do you find the balance, Farnoosh, between stashing cash in this environment, which I'm sure many of us feel pressure to do, versus, uh, you know, having some fun? Because every, you know, hello, it's a pandemic. Um, yeah. Maybe we should actually be eating the cookies. So how would you think about that? Eat all the cookies and all the bagels. Um, Kathy, thank you for your question. I, I think that, you know, going back to your earlier question, Dory, about rules and new sort of unconventional ways of thinking, we used to say pre-pandemic, having about a three to six month rainy day reserve would be sufficient. But now we know that in this job environment, it's taking people about six months to find their next gig. So at least six months rainy day. And what is in that rainy day account, Kathy? I want you to first prioritize this. All of your necessities, your expenses that you have to make every month. Otherwise, you're going to have problems, whether that's your rent, you know, insurance, food, gas, the things that you absolutely need to keep the lights on and, uh, you know, the collectors out of your hair. Uh, that times six in a accessible, liquid savings account. I don't care about the interest rate. I just want this to be convenient, accessible, FDIC insured because you're going to need this money in a pinch. Then with whatever's left, have a blast. You know, and I understand that building that six month reserve is going to take time. So I'm not saying like, if you don't have that for six months, you got to stay home and spend time with your cat only exclusively. Like you can still have fun. Um, but I think you want to budget for that too. So doing a little bit of a hybrid where out of every paycheck, maybe you put 10, 15% for the rainy day until you get to that six month goal. And then another five or 10% for yourself, for yourself, you know, indulgement, indulging. Um, but I think that everyone's also in, in a similar camp. Everybody empathizes with the need to save. So if you are looking to hang out with friends, um, that you talk about what are some easy budget friendly things to do. Maybe it's a picnic in the park. Everybody brings something, a barbecue, everybody brings something, you know, so that even though you are having fun, you're not feeling the pressure to spend too much money. Yeah, great advice, Farnoosh. Thank you very much for that. So another question came in from Anna, who had kind of a technical question for you. I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but uh, perhaps you can provide some guidance. You had advised uh, in answering an earlier question that if someone is having a, a bit of a financial pinch right now, that it's not a bad thing to talk to your landlord or to talk to your college about uh, sort of stretching out the student loan payments, et cetera. And Anna wanted to know, how does that affect your credit score? Will you kind of uh, get in trouble if you're doing that? Or how, how do you think about that in terms yeah. of the need to conserve cash mm -hmm. now with uh, maintaining your credit score for the future? That's an excellent question. And I really want to spend a little bit of time on this because with the passing of the CARES Act, which was essentially that first stimulus bill, um, the government um, was giving a lot of lenders the green light to work with their borrowers to come up with payment plans. And there was a fine print in there that said that um, with these sort of like agreements, whether that's a deferment of your loan or a payment plan, a modification, that this will not be reported negatively to your credit report, um, that it's not going to be considered, you know, um, for you know a uh, a missed payment or a delinquency which can really hurt those kinds of words can really trigger your credit score to fall instead they're going to be reported as current these accounts and you know paying as agreed upon and that is not supposed to hurt your credit so technically speaking and I want everyone to get it in writing because you don't want to just take someone's word over for it over the phone. You want to get your lender to submit a letter that says, here's the plan. You were paying this much, this much money a month for your car loan or your mortgage or your, you know, whatever. Now we've agreed that it's going to be this until this deadline and it will not negatively impact your credit. We will not negatively report this to the credit bureaus. That is your protection. Because unfortunately, Dory, what we are seeing, and I've been doing some investigating around this, I wrote a big piece for Next Advisor on it, is that there are some consumers that are claiming this is not happening. That they go into these agreements and they check their credit report and they see that it was reported as late or not paid. 
when they were under the impression that it was going to be a, a current account paid as agreed upon. Um, so very important to check your credit report as soon as you get into one of these sorts of agreements that you continue to monitor your credit. You can do this now weekly at annualcreditreport.com for free. You can check your credit report. You used to only be able to check your credit report once a year for free. Now you can do it every week. So please do that and be on top of things. And if you do notice any errors, one, you want to report the error to the credit reporting agency that's that's showing this error. Have that evidence, right? That letter uh, to go with your claim. And then also contact the lender and say, what's going on? You know, you told me this, this is what's happening. Look, and maybe they can help you expedite, get to the bottom of things. Usually credit reporting agencies have 30 to 45 days to get back to you with a response. Super helpful, Farnoosh. Thanks for walking us through that. So something that I'm curious about, you have been so dedicated. Uh, you know, I, I have a statistic in my book, Entrepreneurial You. Uh, there was research that was done that the average podcast lasts only 12 episodes before its creator gives up. Uh, yeah. You obviously have been the opposite of that with, uh, with more than 1,100. So you have been interviewing all kinds of people about their approach to, uh, to money and finance, the way they think about things. I'm actually curious what you have learned in this process. Are there one or two tips or practices or things like that that you have picked up from your guests that you have now applied in your own life as a result of having your show, So Money? How much time do we have? Oh my gosh, so many, so many nuggets, so many wisdom bombs. I mean, this is like my podcast, honestly, is a very selfish thing that I do for myself because it keeps me educated, uh, enlightened, and discovering better ways to manage my money. My very first episode with Tony Robbins, uh, he wrote a book uh, called Money Master the Game, I believe it's called. And through that conversation, I was encouraged to go and call my financial advisor and, and ask her to provide a list of all of the funds that I was invested in that had a expense ratio of more than 1%. Because one of the things that he really emphasized in that episode was just how much money we unknowingly spend and lose essentially through the process of investing because of expense ratios. These are the fees that fund managers attach to the mutual funds um, as the, like a management fee. But, you know, if you're paying more than 1%, you got to really question if that is necessary uh, because you might be able to find an equivalent index fund that is a fraction of the cost that's going to get you probably the same results. And, through that, and the thing is that, that compounds story, right? So it's like, you know, I did the math over 30 years. I, with the, with the current structure that I had, the current picks that I had with the expense ratios, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees. So I made some tweaks, I made some tweaks and I don't, and I didn't, and not at the compromise of really my portfolio it was just being a little bit smarter about moving the money around to more cost efficient funds. So that's one thing I'll never forget. Um, the, I had on a, um, Kari Skoglin, who's a director in Hollywood. She directs Handmaid's Tale and Breaking Bad. She's an incredible female director in Hollywood. And, you know, there's not a lot of female directors in Hollywood. So to have her on the show to talk about her navigating her career. And one of the greatest pieces of advice she gave me, which is more career advice, was strive to work with elegant people. And that's a very elegant. interesting word. I like that. What did she mean yeah. by that? So elegant. It doesn't mean that these are people that are like, you know, only nice and only happy all the time. People that are honest with you, that are generous with their advice, that uh, are fair, you know, like you're not going to always agree with elegant people. That's not the point. The point is that there's open dialogue and communication and mutual respect. And 
I guess in the film industry, that's not always the case, but I think in our, all of our respective industries, we know there are some unelegant people that we have to work with from time to time. So it is a privilege, you know, to say like, choose to work only with elegant people. Sometimes you don't have a choice, but if you do have a choice, strive for elegance. I just love that word because I think everyone can get on that train, you know, like I want to work with elegant people. And, um, Let's think, you know, I, I had a, an amazing summer interviewing some prolific black leaders in this world, you know, from entrepreneurs to authors to uh, financial experts. I did a whole series called Black Wealth Matters. It's an album on its own now. You can find it on iTunes. And it was a collection of conversations with uh, people who came on the show to talk about, you know, their journey to achieving financial success, but also the changes that they would like to see in the world to close the inequities, the wealth inequities that, that we know are very true and very deep in this country. And that for me, again, was an enormous education on things like, you know, why do we call it racial wealth gap? Because it's really not just a gap, Dory. It's a freaking, you know, chasm. And it's very wide and very deep. And I think sometimes language is what needs to shift in order for people to really get the magnanimity of the problem and to wake up to the problem. Because we, you know, gap, mind the gap. Eh, you just skip over it, get on your subway or your tube or whatever it is they say in London. Um, but, you know, recognizing the seriousness of the issue through language is one thing that I um, took away. The other was what we talked about earlier, you know, this, this idea of like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. If I can do it, you can too. Those sayings, I think, um, fall a lot of times on deaf ears, it went, depending on who you're talking to, no, maybe they can't follow in your footsteps, right? Because they're dealing with things like racial discrimination and how that impacts your financial wellness and your ability to achieve wealth. All of that came through in that series. And I would encourage, encourage people to, to, to check it out. I'm really proud of it. And it's, um, you know, it's not just that one time that I interviewed black people, you know, there's like many people of color coming on the show all of the time. But I thought because of what was happening in the world, we really needed to take a bit, a, take a beat and really pause and, and dedicate I, uh, the entire month of June actually to Black Wealth Matters. Thank you, Farnoosh. That's great. And uh, to, to the overarching theme about how to use money in empowering ways, there's a great suggestion from Rosinda. She says, uh, creativity arises in moments like this, finding fun things to do cheaper, new business opportunities. It's an amazing moment to focus on new things. So, so true, Rosinda. Thank you very much for Thank sharing you. that. And, and a special thanks to the amazing Farnoosh Tarabi. Uh, Farnoosh, if people want to uh, to learn more about you, I know one place, of course, is farnoosh.tv. Yes. Uh, where else should they look? Somoneypodcast.com uh, is where you can catch the show. And, of course, here on LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'll see you all on the streets one day. That's right. If, if eventually people will be on the streets. Eventually people will be, uh, will be <laughs> back in restaurants. Things. And I, I, I pray for that day. Yeah. We, we all do. I am Dory Clark. You can find out more about me and uh, sign up to learn more at doryclark.com. I'm here on behalf of Newsweek. Farnoosh Tarabi, thank you so much. And thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Dory.